Section 4 of Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White and Laura Victoria. Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases by Ida B. Wells. THE MALICIOUS AND UNTRUTHFUL WHITE PRESS The daily commercial and evening scimitar of Memphis, Tennessee, are owned by leading businessmen of that city, and yet, in spite of the fact that there had been no white women in Memphis outraged by an Afro-American, and that Memphis possessed a thrifty, law-abiding, property-owning class of Afro-Americans, the commercial of May 17, under the head of More Rapes, More Lynchings, gave utterance to the following. The lynching of three Negro scoundrels reported in our dispatches from Anniston, Alabama, for a brutal outrage committed upon a white woman, will be a text for much comment on Southern barbarism by Northern newspapers. But we fancy it will hardly prove effective for campaign purposes among intelligent people. The frequency of these lynchings calls attention to the frequency of the crimes which causes lynching. The Southern barbarism which deserves the serious attention of all people, North and South, is the barbarism which preys upon weak and defenseless women. Nothing but the most prompt, speedy, and extreme punishment can hold in check the horrible and bestial propensities of the Negro race. There is a strange similarity about a number of cases of this character which have lately occurred. In each case, the crime was deliberately planned and perpetrated by several Negroes. They watched for an opportunity when the women were left without a protector. It was not a sudden yielding to a fit of passion, but the consummation of a devilish purpose which has been seeking and waiting for the opportunity. This feature of the crime not only makes it the most fiendishly brutal, but it adds to the terror of the situation in the thinly settled country communities. No man can leave his family at night without the dread that some roving Negro ruffian is watching and waiting for this opportunity. The swift punishment which invariably follows these horrible crimes doubtless acts as a deterring effect upon the Negroes in that immediate neighborhood for a short time, but the lesson is not widely learned nor long remembered. Then such crimes, equally atrocious, have happened in quick succession one in Tennessee, one in Arkansas, and one in Alabama. The facts of the crime appear to appeal more to the Negro's lustful imagination than the facts of the punishment do to his fears. He sets aside all fear of death in any form when opportunity is found for the gratification of his bestial desires. There is small reason to hope for any change for the better. The commission of this crime grows more frequent every year. The generation of Negroes which have grown up since the war have lost in large measure the traditional and wholesome awe of the white race which kept the Negroes in subjection, even when their masters were in the army and their families left unprotected except by the slaves themselves. There is no longer a restraint upon the brute passion of the Negro. What is to be done? The crime of rape is always horrible, but to the southern man there is nothing which so fills the soul with horror, loathing, and fury as the outraging of a white woman by a negro. It is the race question in the ugliest, vilest, most dangerous aspect. The negro as a political factor can be controlled, but neither laws nor lynchings can subdue his lusts. Sooner or later it will force a crisis. We do not know in what form it will come. In its issue of June 4, the Memphis Evening Scimitar gives the following excuse for lynch law. Aside from the violation of white women by Negroes, which is the outcropping of a bestial perversion of instinct, the chief cause of trouble between the races in the South is the Negro's lack of manners. In the state of slavery, he learned politeness from association with white people who took pains to teach him. Since the emancipation came and the tie of mutual interest and regard between master and servant was broken, 
the negro has drifted away into a state which is neither freedom nor bondage lacking the proper inspiration of the one and the restraining force of the other he has taken up the idea that boorish insolence is independence and the exercise of a decent degree of breeding toward white people is identical with servile submission in consequence of the prevalence of this notion there are many negroes who use every opportunity to make themselves offensive particularly when they think it can be done with impunity we have had too many instances right here in memphis to doubt this and our experience is not exceptional the white people won't stand this sort of thing and whether they be insulted as individuals or as a race the response will be prompt and effectual the bloody riot of 1866, in which so many Negroes perished, was brought on principally by the outrageous conduct of the blacks towards the whites on the streets. It is also a remarkable and discouraging fact that the majority of such scoundrels are Negroes who have received educational advantages at the hands of the white taxpayers. They have got just enough of learning to make them realize how hopelessly their race is behind the other in everything that makes a great people, and they attempt to get even by insolence, which is ever the resentment of inferiors. There are well-bred Negroes among us, and it is truly unfortunate that they should have to pay, even in part, the penalty of the offenses committed by the baser sort. But this is the way of the world. The innocent must suffer for the guilty. If the Negroes as a people possessed a hundredth part of the self-respect which is evidenced by the courteous bearing of some that the scimitar could name, the friction between the races would be reduced to a minimum. It will not do to beg the question by pleading that many white men are also stirring up strife. The Caucasian blackguard simply obeys the promptings of a depraved disposition and he is seldom deliberately rough or offensive towards strangers or unprotected women. The Negro, though, on the contrary, is given to just that kind of offending, and he almost invariably singles out white people as his victims. On March 9, 1892, there were, lynched in this same city, three of the best specimens of young since the war on Afro-American manhood. They were peaceful, law-abiding citizens and energetic businessmen. They believed the problem was to be solved by eschewing politics and putting money in the purse. They owned a flourishing grocery business in a thickly populated suburb of Memphis, and a white man named Barrett had one on the opposite corner. After a personal difficulty which Barrett sought by going into the people's grocery, drawing a pistol, and was thrashed by Calvin McDowell, he, Barrett, threatened to clean them out. These men were a mile beyond the city limits and police protection. Hearing that Barrett's crowd was coming to attack them Saturday night, they mustered forces and prepared to defend themselves against the attack. When Barrett came, he led a posse of officers, twelve in number, who afterward claimed to be hunting a man for whom they had a warrant. That twelve men in citizens' clothes should think it necessary to go in the night to hunt one man who had never before been arrested or made any record as a criminal has never been explained. When they entered the back door, the young men thought the threatened attack was on and fired into them. Three of the officers were wounded, and when the defending party found it was officers of the law upon whom they had fired, they ceased and got away. Thirty-one men were arrested and thrown in jail as conspirators although they all declared more than once they did not know they were firing on officers. Excitement was at fever beat until the morning papers, two days after, announced that the wounded deputy sheriffs were out of danger. This hindered rather than helped the plans of the whites. There was no law on the statute books which would execute an Afro-American for wounding a white man. But the unwritten law did. Three of these men the president, the manager, and clerk of the grocery, the leaders of the conspiracy, were secretly taken from jail and lynched in a shockingly brutal manner. The Negroes are getting too independent, they say. We must teach them a lesson. What lesson? 
the lesson of subordination. Kill the leaders, and it will cow the Negro who dares to shoot a white man, even in self-defense. Although the race was wild over the outrage, the mockery of law and justice which disarmed men and locked them up in jails where they could be easily and safely reached by the mob, the Afro-American ministers, newspapers, and leaders counseled obedience to the law, which did not protect them. Their counsel was heeded, and not a hand was uplifted to resent the outrage. Following the advice of the free speech, people left the city in great numbers. The dailies and associated press reports heralded these men to the country as toughs and negro desperados who kept a low dive. This same press service printed that the Negro who was lynched at Indianola, Mississippi, in May, had outraged the sheriff's eight-year-old daughter. The girl was more than eighteen years old, and was found by her father in this man's room, who was a servant on the place. Not content with misrepresenting the race, the mob spirit was not to be satisfied until the paper, which was doing all it could to counteract this impression, was silenced. The colored people were resenting their bad treatment in a way to make itself felt, yet gave the mob no excuse for further murder, until the appearance of the editorial, which is construed as a reflection on the honor of the southern white women. It is not half so libelous as that of the commercial which appeared four days before, and which has been given in these pages. They would have lynched the manager of the free speech, for exercising the right of free speech, if they had found him as quickly as they would have hung a rapist, and glad of the excuse to do so. The owners were ordered not to return. The free speech was suspended with as little compunction as the business of the people's grocery, broken up, and the proprietors murdered. End of Section 4 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista And Laura Victoria in North Carolina in July 2013.